Hello and welcome to this next exercise. We're looking at another test on two population means. Uh, this time we have this designed as what we call a matched sample design. So this is a little bit of a different type of uh, experimental design, uh, we'd call it. And really it's just a different way in which the data is collected. So it's a different way that we've sort of designed our experiment. So I'll talk a little bit more about that when I, when I get to the data. Let's go through the problem to get a little context here. So here we're looking at gasoline outlets who frequently advertise the benefits of their fuel additives in maintaining clean and smooth running engines. However, there's some disagreement on whether or not it affects fuel efficiency. In order to determine if the additive affects fuel efficiency, a chain of gas stations measured fuel efficiency in five cars with the additive and then without the additive. Uh, the following table provides our data. Okay, so here what we've done, for this to be a matched sample design, means that we are applying both treatments, and what I mean by that, here's one treatment and here's another treatment, we're applying both treatments to the same observational unit. And so the observational unit is that thing uh, that, that is giving us the, the data point. So in this example, uh, that car is the thing that we are applying a treatment to, and it is the car that is then giving us the data point. The data point being just one of these numbers. Now, how is this different from before? Well, the other test that we've done when we're working with two populations uh, is that we have two independent populations, meaning instead of having just five cars, here I would have five five cars without the additive and another five cars with the additive. Now what that does is it introduces to the data set another source of variation. So we often talk about three different sources of variation and we'll, we'll look at this in much more depth I think in module 13 when we get there. Uh, there's one source of variation that is just always random variation within within a data set. So that's random variation Oops, within within our numbers. Another source of variation uh, is the variation that exists between treatments. So the fact that whether there is or is not a difference um, between our two treatments, that introduces some variation into the, into the data set. In this case, there's a third source of variation brought into this data set due to the fact that if we're using five cars here and five cars here, those cars, those 10 cars, or the five cars used in each of these two treatments, those cars are not the same. They're different cars. This car would not be the same as this car, and this car is not the same as this car. And so that difference between the experimental units, that introduces this third source of variation into the data set. So that's what would exist when we're looking at two completely independent random samples. So in the previous exercises in this module, that was the case. We had those two independent random samples. In the matched sample design now, we eliminate that one source of variation by having just five cars, and I give all five cars both treatments. So I'm getting two data points from each of my five cars. Now what we do by eliminating that one source of variation, the, the, the heterogeneity or the variability introduced due to the difference in cars, now what we do is we calculate those difference values. So this difference value is calculated with the additive minus without the additive. So this is 24 minus 21, 15 minus 16, and so on. So what we do now, we have all of these difference values. Now the test is done on this average difference. Rather than as we would have done before, with the two independent samples, we would have calculated an X bar here and an X bar there, and then calculated the difference between those two for our test statistics, all this other stuff, and, and gone through the test that way. Now, we only need to concern ourselves with D bar. And so now our test statistic becomes just D bar minus whatever is the hypothesized difference divided by the standard error. And as you can see, that looks very similar to a single sample test statistic, right? The notation has changed a little bit. That just reflects the type of test that we're doing, but the calculations are really the same. Okay, so, so that's what we're going to do here. So we've got uh, some understanding of the difference in the, the 
experimental design, so let's get into formulating our test. Now, this is where one other small difference will come up, and that is simply in the notation. When we were looking at two independent random samples, we were looking at a difference in means. So we were calculating mu1 minus mu2, and then we had upper tail, lower tail, two tail test. But now, we're calculating not a difference in means, now we're calculating the mean difference. And so I always stress for my students to pay attention to the notation because it has a meaning. This notation communicates the type of experimental design that, uh, that is being employed here. So here we're doing, it tells us this is a two-tail test. We are just testing to see is there a difference or not uh, in fuel efficiency. So my justification here, uh, it's formulated this way so that if the evidence supports the null hypothesis, uh, then I'm unable to say that the additive has had any impact uh, whatsoever on fuel efficiency. If we reject the null hypothesis, then that evidence supports the statement that uh, the additive has had an impact on fuel efficiency. So there's our test. Again, it's important to, cal to, to illustrate or to communicate how the difference has been calculated just as we did for the, the two independent random samples, we always had to define our populations. This one, we define how that difference is calculated. And again, that would determine, if we were doing a one-tail test, that would determine if it's an upper-tail or a lower-tail test. Again, for a two-tail test, not quite as, excuse me, not quite as critical, but still an important piece of information. So let's go ahead and perform the test. Alpha is 05. We want to gather the ingredients for our test statistic here. And so far, our, all we have is the hypothesized difference and the sample size. So we need to calculate this uh, average difference. And then we also will need to calculate our standard deviation. Oh, my calculator disappeared. OK. So let's go ahead. I'll calculate the, the average difference. 3 minus 1 plus 3 minus 2 plus 2. So I have a, a total of 5 divided by, we have 5 observations, so that's just going to be 1. And then for the sample standard deviation, I'm going to need a little bit more room. This is a bit more of a tedious calculation. So you remember that formula. We're looking at the differences oops, between individual values. So di I'm using to denote an individual difference. So these are my di values minus the d bar, the average difference, square it, add those up across n, divided by n minus 1, and we take the square root of all of this. So it'll be a little bit of a long, but I think the numbers are easy enough. We'll be able to do it uh, fairly quickly. So I'm going to write this out. My first observation is way up at the top of the screen here. 3 minus our average difference is 1 squared, plus the next one is minus 1 minus 1 squared, plus 3 minus 1 squared, plus minus 2 minus 1 squared, plus 2 minus 1 squared. We divide all that by, we have 5 observations, 5 minus 1, and square root everything. So I think we can probably do that numerator in our without the calculator, right? 3 minus 1 is 2, 2 squared is 4, minus 1 minus 1 is minus 2 squared is 4 again. 3 minus 1, here I have another 4. Minus 2 minus 1 is minus 3 squared is 9. Plus, and then 2 minus 1 squared is just 1. Divide all that by 4. Square root everything. And let's get that calculator out again. 4 plus 4 plus 4 plus 9 plus 1. 22 divided by 4 square root, so 2.35, 2.35. Okay, so now we've got all of our ingredients for our test statistic. If I come back up here, so this is 1 minus 0, our hypothesized value there is 0, divided by 2.35 over square root of n. I'm just going to write down up here, d bar was 1 and s was 2.35 because I just might need those again. Uh, oh, and n, we know what n is, this was 5. Okay, so let's get that. 1 divided by 
2.35 over root 5, so 0 0.95. 0 0.95 is our t statistic. In this case, that's our test statistic. So what do we do? Okay, we've got part B now is 0.95, so now we need to uh, go to our t-tables and obtain uh, the corresponding p-value, or at least we'll get a range of p-value. We first need our degrees of freedom, and our degrees of freedom, I'll write this in over here, this is n minus 1, so 5 minus 1 is 4 degrees of freedom. So I'll go to our t-distribution, Here's four degrees of freedom, and I'm looking for our test statistic, t was equal to 0 0.95. So I come around and it looks like it's somewhere in between here. So that's a probability between 0.2 and 0.15. Now this is a two-tailed test, don't forget. So our p-value is double that. So that's gonna be something less than 0.4 greater than 0.3. So this is 0 0.15, 0 0.15 times 2, and this is 0 0.2 times 2. Okay, so there's our p-value for this test. So let's come back over here. Oops. So our p-value is less than 0.4, greater than 0.3. Our level of significance for this test was here, 0.05. So with a p-value that is uh, greater than 0.3, and if we just look at this, well, if it's greater than 0.3, then it's certainly greater than 0.5. Our rejection rule here is the same. We only reject if the p-value is less than alpha. This is certainly much larger than alpha, so we do not reject. I have insufficient evidence to show that this additive has had any influence on uh, overall fuel efficiency. Okay, so that's good. We've got our conclusion and we've got our interpretation. So here that, uh, again, I repeat myself, by not rejecting the null hypothesis uh, means that we are unable to show that this fuel additive has affected uh, fuel efficiency. Okay, so that's all there is to it for the test. Now, I'm going to add one more little bit of analysis to this. Let's add a part E. I want to do a confidence interval here as well, just to show, again, how we can compare the results of a confidence interval to the results of a two-tailed test. In this case, it's a matched sample design. It's a different experimental design, but that comparability between a confidence interval and a two-tailed test, uh, it still exists. So here our alpha was 0.05, so one minus alpha, we'll do a 95% confidence interval. Now our formula, uh, it's, it's just, it's always the same, really. It's always the point estimate, plus or minus uh, some critical value times the standard error. So it's always the same component. Sometimes the formulas are a little bit different, but it's always the same basic components. So here we have uh, our point estimate. We already calculated was one. Let me just, I'll just draw a picture. Oh, that's so messy. Something always happens when I write at the bottom of the screen, it gets messy. Okay, so here's our interval. Point estimate was one. So this is going to be one plus or minus, I need a critical value, alpha divided by two is 0 0.025, because uh, alpha is 0 0.5, and we have four degrees of freedom. So if I go to my t distribution, four degrees of freedom, and alpha divided by two is 0 0.025, so there's that critical value there, 2.776. So this is 2.776 times, oh, I'm gonna run out of space there, times our standard deviation, 2.35 divided by the square root of five. So this is one plus or minus, let's get that margin of error, 2.776 times 2.35 divided by root five, 
2.92. Okay, so we can get our upper limit, so add that to 1, 3.92, 3.92, and finally, our lower limit. Our low. Oh, can you hear that bear in my office? There's another dog outside, and she's not happy about it. She's growling at the door. Okay, and the last bit one minus three point nine two equals minus two point ninety two. Okay, so there's that confidence interval. So what this means is we're 95% confident that the true average difference is between 2.92 and 3.92. Uh, this is measured in miles per gallon, I think. I didn't write it in there. This is a fuel efficiency rating. So the, the true population average difference is between, say, 2.9 and 3.9. Uh, and so because zero exists in that interval as our hypothesized value, our hypothesized value here was zero, and because zero exists within that interval, that's the consistency. The fact that I'm 95% confident that the true population difference is between 2.9 and 3.9, zero is a possibility, and for that reason, that's why I am unable to say that it is not zero because at that level of confidence, zero is a possibility. I can't say that it's negative two, I can't say that it's positive three, all I can say is that it's somewhere within those limits, and because zero exists within those limits, that is why we do not reject, and that is why we say I can't say it is something other than zero, because zero is, at that level of confidence, zero is a possibility. Okay, so that video turned out a little bit longer than I thought, probably because I added that confidence interval in. Uh, but hopefully that all makes sense, and these match sample designs, uh, uh, again, are very similar to the single sample case that we looked at in Module 9. The process is all the same. It's really just the way that the, the uh, data is gathered. So hopefully that all makes sense. Thank you so much for watching, and see you again. Bye-bye.